Hey guys, Dave from Nerdarchy, Four Nerds by Nerds. I know this nerd. Nerdarchist Ted. And we begin our deep dive into Xanathar's Guide to Everything. This time we're going to talk about subclasses for the Barbarian. Jump down to the description below where you can sign up for Nerdarchy the newsletter, get weekly gaming tips, as well as learn how to game with Nerdarchy. All right, we're going to do our first dive into Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Uh, both of these books are the books we're actually giving away. So if you saw our flip through, you can learn how to win these books. Uh, there's a Gleam contest we have over on in the description of that video. So you can go check it out. The the the, the contest is going on till I believe the 21st is when we end it. Somewhere's around there. For the specifics though, you can see the contest on the flip through we did. Uh, so Xanthor guys, everything, Nerdarchy flips through. Bang. But if you want to buy your copy, go to the description below. You can get a link to Amazon and get it there. So we're going to dive into Barbarian classes today. We're going to touch on a couple different things. We're going to compare it to the UA that was released, the Unearthed Arcana, as well as upon request, we're going to talk about how to how to use these kind of archetypes as villains in your game. Right. So, well, technically subclasses. That's well, what Wizards of the Coast is calling them. Everything is a subclass. Now, Barbarians, before you even get into the actual three different paths that we've gotten that are new. You, we get a couple things. We get personal totems, we get tattoos, and superstitions. And these are basically things uh, that you can either pick from a table, randomly roll, or maybe they'll inspire you to do your own to kind of like flesh out your barbarian and customize him a little bit for his background and his personality and that kind of stuff. So we're getting further and further away from that concept of... I want to just make a generic this. Because if you've got a background choice, you've got a race choice, you've got a class choice, you've got a subclass choice, and then now you're having further things that you can add on within that. I think it just it just keeps expanding out and allowing you to make characters that are just so vastly different from the next guy at the table. I, I think it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, th these little fluff pieces that are added in the beginning, like, we didn't need them to to do to our characters, but if you're new to the game, or maybe you're not as, a cr as creative as some other folks, this is a good jumping off point. This can get you started. So, I, I think it's a good addition to the game. So, the, the personal totem's pretty cool. You got tattoos, and it, it kind of speaks a little bit to the tribal culture a, a little bit, and I thought that was pretty interesting. But the most thrilling chart to me was the superstitions because I I, I was like, oh, I could do a lot with those. And you don't necessarily have to be a barbarian. Like You could play up some of these things in just other characters. And the first one just sent my brain, you know, reeling with ideas. So I'm going to read this one. It says, is if you disturb the bones of the dead, you inherit all the troubles that plague them in life. I'm like, oh, man. Think about what you could do with that. Number one, you've got you've got adventure ideas that are linked off of that. You've got curses that you can do off of that. I, I was just spinning off of just that one sentence of like, all right, I'm I'm littered with ideas of what I want to do with that. With just that one sentence. Yeah, we're on page eight in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. And you know, even just on page eight and nine, we get a little ex excerpt from Xanathar himself for mm -hmm. each of them, of course. Uh, we get some cool art, which you guys would have saw in the flip through. So going into the primal pass now, we have Path of Ancestral Guardian. All right, so now this is the one that you clearly have the, the ancestral spirits of your past following you around in, you know, sometimes visible, sometimes, you know, non-visible, you know, spectrum. You know, I actually kind of like went through the Unearthed Arcana and what we get now and kind of did a little comparison so ancestral protectors is the first thing you get so says, while you're raging the first creature you hit with an attack on your turn becomes the target of the warriors which hinder its attacks so you you physically manifest your spirits when you rage and the first thing you go after is the thing that these guys are, are going to bother uh, so until the start of your next turn that that target has disadvantage on any attack roll that isn't against you and when a target hits a creature other than you with an attack that creature has resistance to the damage dealt by the attack. The effect of the target ends early if your rage ends. Before, you know, before it took a uh, took a bonus action to do this. Okay. Now it's the first creature you hit. 
right? So that that is the difference. And also, there used to be a disengage mechanic as well, where uh, you would you would lose movement if you disengage within five foot of of this barbarian. That's been totally removed. Okay. So that was kind of that was kind of <clears throat> nerfed out. At a uh, sixth level, the guardian spirit that aids you can provide supernatural protection to those you defend. If you are raging and another creature you can see within 30 feet of you takes damage, you can use your reaction to reduce the damage by 2d6. It goes up uh, as you level in this class, 3d6 at 10th, 4d6 at 14th. Uh, I think it's fantastic given, you know, barbarians a, a use for their reaction. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a great ability. I really enjoy it. Here the, the change is uh, you have dice damage instead of transfer and resistance, which this is actually better in my opinion because... Before, you would just transfer your resistance to an ally, and you would lose it. So now, you still get your resistance. You can nerf some of the damage that they're getting. It's thematic. It's fun. So, so at low levels, you, you, you technically can completely negate damage. Uh, and then as you, as you go up, it might not mean as much. But I, you know, I can imagine any party member is going to be happy that you're reducing the damage on any attack incoming. So... Uh, tenth, tenth level, you gain the ability to consult with your ancestral spirits. When you do so, you cast the Augury or Clairvoyance spell without using a spell slot or material components. Uh, rather than creating a spherical sensor, uh, this use of Clairvoyance invisibly, invisibly summons one of your ancestral spirits to the chosen location. Wisdom is your spellcasting ability for these spells. Uh, after you cast either one, you can't do it again until you finish a short or long rest. I think this this ability is fantastic. It's solely a role playing and you know quest management you know facility. There's no combat orientation here, but to actually be able to consult your ancestors, I think it's awesome and it's vastly different than what was in the UA. You know, while there's not a direct combat correlation, you do have the ability to do some uh, some. Uh, reconnaissance with clairvoyance that can be very useful augury for making decisions also useful not only is this way better and i want to say more powerful than what was in the ua it's also way more interesting in the ua three times a day you could get advantage on intelligence or wisdom maybe charisma save as well <clears throat> you know which is cool but i like this better yeah, I, I look at this and i'm like I, I i would play this kind of character that if i had no reason to do so, I would still be, you know, doing an augury to talk to talk to them and having a, a relationship with the the NPC that's long dead. Like, you know, this is this is what I encountered today. This is this, these are the things that I faced. How could I have done better? Yeah. So, so that you're you're always I would have this character talking to the spirits all the time, whether he's using abilities or not. <laughs> nice. Yeah, you know, people might just think he's crazy, but sometimes the spirits answer back. That's true. So we get into the Vengeful Ancestors at 14th level. Uh, your ancestral spirits grow powerful enough to retaliate when you use your spirit shield to reduce the damage of an attack. So your 6th level ability, when you use your reaction to cause an ally to take less damage, your ancestors actually attack back. The attacker takes an amount of force damage equal to the damage that your spirit shield prevents. So it's not costing you any extra, so now you're reducing damage to your ally and causing damage to your enemies. Totally awesome. Yeah, and obviously this one had to change a lot because, you know, the ability it's tied to change. Right. So it, it's basically new and rewritten. It works. It's, it's decent. I, I like it. Yeah, I, I'm... Of the three... Like, this is the one that appeals the most to me, but they're all fantastic. So with that, that brings us to Path of the Storm Herald. So we get into the third level. You animate a stormy magical aura while you rage. And when you choose this ability, you, you really have to pick a terrain, and it, you're stuck to it until you gain a level in this class, and then you can change it. So you have Desert, Sea, and Tundra. So for each ability, each level that you would gain ability from this subclass, you're getting something specific to that terrain. So desert, you create an aura that everyone takes fire damage that goes up as you level. Uh, when you're in this, when you're in the sea, uh, and you, when this effect is activated, you can choose one other creature you can see in your aura. The target must succeed in a dexterity saving throw. The target takes d6 lightning damage on a failed save, half as much damage on a successful one. The damage increases as you gain levels. Uh, the tundra I thought was a little wonky. It was initially cold damage, but they're like, 
Nah, it's cold damage and fire damage. It's the same kind of effect, just different types. So we're going to change it to, it helps your allies and they get temporary hit points. Yeah, I, well, I actually like it. I like the fact that they make them significantly different. I like that they're different. I felt that one was a little bit stretching. Uh, the fact that they're they're numb to damage. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, it ignores you against the cold. And I'm like, really? <laughs> okay. Hey, man, I find the cold invigorating. <laughs> so there's actually a couple changes on this one. All right. Uh, so this one was actually completely overhauled from the original. Uh, the the effects now require a bonus action each round to make them happen. So before they didn't, they, they it was just kind of like you raised, it was on. Um, they had wonky math in the first version. They removed they removed that. And matter of fact, like we, even when we reviewed it before, it's like, why don't you just say at level X it does this, right? Because anytime I have to use order of operation for math for the, to figure out the rules and if that's really what you meant or not, or if you mm -hmm. just want it done, uh, you know, it, it it's there's definitely room for confusion fusion there. And I think the best thing they could have did is what they did do and just changed it up. They also they kind of nerfed it a little bit mm -hmm. uh, because before I think you were you know you were do the damaging effects were doing a little bit more damage, but all in all I I like it I like the differences so I'm I'm good with the changes they made. So at at sixth level, the storm grants you benefits when your aura isn't active. So this is these are all the time benefits which I think which I think are great. The desert gives you resistance to fire damage and you don't suffer the effects of extreme heat which is great. Moreover, as an action, you can touch a flammable object that isn't being worn or carried by somebody else and set it on fire. I love that. I, th I think it's cool. It's just like, yep, I got I got a fire lit, guys. <laughs> uh, when you go to C, you gain resistance to lightning damage, you can breathe underwater, and you get a swim speed. When you go to Tundra, you're resistant to cold damage, you don't suffer the effects of extreme cold, and moreover, as an action, you can touch water and turn it in... Turn a five-foot cube of it into ice, which melts after a minute. Uh, the action fails if a creature is in the cube. Now, this is another one where they've made drastic changes because each of them has another ability that wasn't in there at all. Yeah, they're ribbon abilities. And the ribbon abilities are kind of like things that you could probably do interesting and cool things with. You would just have to be a little more creative with it. But yeah, the, the ribbon abilities weren't there before. Yeah, you couldn't burn things, you couldn't make the ice cube, and you didn't have a swim speed. Other than that, it was, it, it is pretty, mechanically, it's essentially the same. Mm -hmm. So when we move on to 10th uh, level, Shielding the Storm, you learn, to uh, you learn to use your mastery of the storm to protect others. Each creature of your choice has a damage res resistance you gained from the storm's, storm soul feature while the creature is in your storm aura. Now that one's exactly the same. It has not changed mm -hmm. at all. Well, I mean, that's good to see that, that some things people like. <laughs> uh, then we move on to 14th level. The power of the storm you channel grows mightier, lashing out at your foes. The effect is based on the environment that you've chose. Desert, immediately after a creature in your aura hits you with an attack, you can use your reaction to force that creature to make a dex saving throw. On a failed save, the creature takes fire damage equal to half your barbarian level. The C, when you hit a creature in your aura with an attack, you can use a reaction to force that creature to make a strength save. If they fail, they're knocked prone, as if by a wave. And Tundra, whenever the effect of your storm aura, aura is activated, you can choose one creature that you can see in that aura. That creature must succeed on a strength saving throw, or its speed is re reduced to zero until the start of your next turn, as Magical Frost covers it. This one, completely a rewrite. They changed everything in here. Um, the desert is damaged with a reaction now instead of a control effect that it was before. The control effect before was kind of interesting. Uh, C adds the prone effect with a reaction to the target of the area, just as we said. And, you know, it was something different before. And Tundra can stop movement of one creature instead of all, which, you know, it was before. So they've all changed, they've all changed a little bit. It's a little bit more tied to, re to your actions. It's a little bit of a nerfing, I think. Mm. But I, I don't feel like it really takes away from the class at all. Now, I will point out, guys, if you've seen Thor Ragnarok, like the C1, yeah, 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 you saw that in action, that aura. <laughs> that was freaking amazing. Now, I, I'm going to say that I like this one, but I have to actually see it in action because when you're reading it, you're seeing all the different effects and you really only get to see one throughout. I like, I actually like the C mm -hmm. one the most. But I would rather reflavor it as storm instead of sea, mm -hmm. and and play it that way. 
You see this guy as a sailor? N neither, actually. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, you got to go see Thor Ragnarok. Oh. See what <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> but, you know, the idea of bat, you know, raging and lightning is, you know, shooting off of you is pretty awesome. All right. I also see this as, like, a really cool barbarian that worships Thor, so... You know, just, you know, even, even without Thor Ragnarok, it, right. it just like the lightning's there, you know, knocking prone instead of a wave. What if it was thunder? Right. You know, you could do some fun things with that, I think. Yeah. And I mean, anytime you're, you know, cinematically changing, changing things without mechanically changing it, it's not really that big a deal. Agreed. So we move on to the path of the zealot. Uh, third level, you get Divine Fury while you're raging. The first creature you hit on your turns with a weapon attack takes extra damage equal to 1d6 plus half your Barbarian level. It's either Necrotic or Radiant. You choose when you choose this ability. On this one, they realized they kind of went a little too far. It used to be an aura. Now it's just, you know, when you hit somebody. Mm -hmm. And the first somebody, yeah. Yeah. So they, <laughs> they brought that back. But it's, it, a, it's the first thing per turn. So you're still getting extra, extra damage all the time. Yeah, you're always getting extra damage. And they probably realized, like, how... I'm sure after some of the playtesting came out, and they're like, yeah, like, the one round, my Barbarian did so much damage, it was ridiculous. <laughs> uh, third level, uh, you also get Warrior of the Gods. Your soul is marked for endless battle. This, this one I love. Anytime you're... You're brought, you're, a spell affects you that you're brought back to life, and that's the sole purpose of it is to bring you back to life. No material components required. Yeah, this is like the the, the cleric that has revivication's best friend. <laughs> or revivify. Revivify, yeah. So, and this one, no change is exactly the same. It was perfect the way it was before they left it. So, I, 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 you know, I see a character that, you know, in our past that this would have been very useful for. Uh, so, 6th level, the divine power that fuels your rage can protect you. If you fail a saving throw while you're raging, you can re-roll it, and you must use a new roll. You can use this ability once per rage. This one this one changed. They changed the name of it. It was Zealous Focus before. Now it's fanatic and Fanatical Focus. And also, it used to be an autosave, and you came out of your rage. Mm. And you could use it once a day. Now, it's every time you rage. So... You're getting to use it a lot more because barbarians get a lot of rages to use and they they increase very rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, so I actually like this change and it also isn't like, it's not the auto thing. Uh, so yeah, I like it. I think it's an improvement. So it's like, oh, every time I fail a save, you know, I'll, I'll just end my rage and start a new one. <laughs> All right. So at 10th level, you learn to channel divine power to inspire zealotry in others. As a bonus action, you unleash a battle cry infused with divine energy Ten creatures within 60 feet that here you gain advantage on attack rolls and saving throws until the start of your next turn. You can use it once per long rest. This one got better. Nice. Uh, Zealous Presence used to be an action. Now it's just a bonus action. As it should be. <laughs> so yeah. it's it's a, it's definitely gotten yeah, better. All right, so then we move on to Rage Beyond Death. Beginning at 14th level, Divine Power that fuels you, fuels your rage, allows you to shrug off fatal blows. This is the one that's utterly fantastic. You can be at zero... You're still taking damage, but you're still fighting. You don't care. You're still taking death saving throws. Doesn't make a difference. And I love the change that they made in this one because it used to say that, you know, if you fail, if you die because of failed death saving throws, as long as your rage is still going, you're still fighting. But it used to say that you would just die when your rage ends. Now, if you've been healed, you can still be alive. <laughs> so it's like, all right, you know, the battle is over. And I'm sitting there smacking myself while the cleric's walking over to come heal me. And he can, he can ping me for one point of healing, and I'm alive. It doesn't matter how many, how many wounds that are in me. All right, so that, there's our barbarian, or barbarians subclasses. Uh, lots of very cool options to do. So now, as per, per request from some of our fans out there, how would we turn these, these three subclasses into villainous? options well first of all they all have uh, suits of abilities that are going to make them really really uh fun to use a high level zealot is going to be a nightmare for for your party because you're gonna have to figure out how to snap him out of rage not just kill him so so that part mechanically will be challenging for the party mm -hmm. um so all right so we, what do we got here we got we've got the path of the ancestral guardian that's our first one you know, someone who, who follows and speaks to, you know, the past. 
I don't think that actually affects anything too much, but what what it might be is that you come from a conquering barbarian tribe or you know or or even like he's the bodyguard for for the big vet bad and he owes a life debt or something. So he's sworn to protect and defend, which makes sense because you want to use mechanically you want to use him with allies, yeah, not by himself. You know, and you could as since it's whether you're looking to do this as a, you know, a long-standing villain, whether you're looking to do this as a singular encounter, you know, I would be inclined to actually incorporate some kind of spiritual manifestation in this combat. Because, like, when you're taking things away from the PC side of things and doing it as an actual encounter, I would want to put something out there. So that if you've got some spirits that can be attacked and some spirits that are just the manifestations of this guy, it becomes an interesting mechanic for the players to have to deal with. And, you know, it could wind, they could wind up attacking something that isn't really there. So that's another layer of the challenge itself. I, you know, now I'm envisioning like, you know, specters or ghosts fighting alongside of, mm-hmm. of the, of this one and him sending his spirits to help protect it, mm-hmm. which is kind of weird and confusing. Well, I mean, you have to look at it from the other side. So, I mean, you know, all of this is, you know, a, a tribal mentality. So if you're talking about a conquering thing or you're talking about somebody who possibly worships death and it's like until you brought maybe maybe you've got this this tribal thing that until you've brought enough death to the world you're not welcome there. So Oh, you know, that's an interesting concept too as far as you know maybe that's just that he worships death and that you know spirits follow him around less so the ancestral thing and more so you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a friend to the ghost. <laughs> but, you know, so like you have to bring enough death to the world in order, in order for you to be welcome there. So therefore you're surrounded by necrotic energy. You're surrounded by, you know, the, the spirits. You're not, you're not liking the skeletons and the zombies and things, but the wraiths and the specters. You know, well, the... maybe you do. Like, why, why not? It's just that, you know, your powers don't actually involve them no. is all. I, I just, that's not the way I was envisioning it. I'm just saying there's different ways to do it. <laughs> That's true. Uh, but if you're saying that he worships death, then it could be like a death cult barbarian. Like, you could definitely use heavily use undead, and it kind of works. So next next we have... Uh, Herald. The, the Herald of the Storm. Uh, I dig this one. Uh, you know, they could be, you know, a champion of an area. And, you know, I, I see, like, maybe all you're trying to do is gain passage. And... One thing after another, you're button heads with, you know, the, this guy or this gal, uh, you know, and all you're doing is constantly stomping all over his terrain, and he's not happy with it, so you keep coming to blows over it. Right, or it could literally, like, be the the idea of it's a single encounter or, you know, a single small series of encounters where in order to gain access to some place, th- this, this is the guardian that you have to bypass, and, you know, maybe it happens through combat. Maybe it happens through role playing and negotiations. The zealot, Path of the Zealot, is the most fun to use as a bad guy. One, he's freaking hard to kill. <laughs> Two, he's the villain that can keep coming back. Like, that's part of their shtick anyway. Yes. You, you know, so that part would be really annoying. You know, they hit hard, they do extra damage. You know, this guy, this guy could be a, a leader, he could be a follower, he could be a bodyguard. Or gal, as the case may be, but either way, you know he is the embodiment of one of one, some war god or another, and you know he's the villain that's going to be a thorn in your side. I think this is the easiest to use. I mean, he's a he's a straight up you know meat wall that, as you said, has the ability to keep coming coming back because there's no no financial cost to it. Oh, you killed him. Whoopty flipping dude. No, 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 no. He's back. <laughs> yeah, like he could be a favored for, you know, a war, favored warlord of Tempest or somebody uh-huh. if you're using Forgotten Realms or, or Hextor if you're using, you know, Greyhawk or, you know, any any warlike deity. And I mean, it doesn't even have to, doesn't even have to stop there. I mean, you, you could, you know, you could flavor this guy a little bit, you know, make, make him be a, a barbarian blade lock. And, you know, he's he's got a demonic, you know, cleric. That, that the cleric's sole job is to just bring him back. He doesn't have to be all. He doesn't have to be all the way to fourteenth level. But you know, for some reason, he's been chosen, and it's he, like he's got his own red priest. 
Yeah. <laughs> from Game of Thrones. Yep. Yeah, so this guy is like the con- could be the consummate Thord in the party side because he keeps coming back to annoy them time and time again. So, what do you guys think? Are you reading Xenathar's Guide? What do you think of the Barbarians? Aren't they fantastic? Let us know what you guys think down in the comments below. While you're at it, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Hey, and look in the description. We'll send you. A, we'll put a link there to the contest page as well. So until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.